Okay, so uh, first thing, I just want to note, I recorded everybody's presence at the poetry uh, reading this morning, so everybody will get extra credit for that. Even There were even people who are not here now <laughs> this morning, so. Um, all right. Um, so we got a vocab quiz on Sunday, um, finish it by midnight, and then for Tuesday, you're going to be reading about the next 60 pages or so of Mrs. Dalloway, and we'll be having our first presentation. So uh, Bree is going to enlighten us on um, the role of Septimus Smith in the novel and kind of like generally that kind of World War I mental illness background. Yes. Um, okay, so does anybody, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask a question. Yeah, you, of course. Um, if I do bring candy for this presentation, is everyone okay with jelly beans? Okay. Are there any allergies? No jelly bean allergies. All right, that was good to know. Yes. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any other questions about upcoming assignments or anything else? Not for it. If we wanted you to kind of review our presentation, can we like send it to you through email and have you like feedback on it? Or Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, I actually I did need to talk to you because you're the you're next up. Okay. And I actually do want to speak with each of you a week before the oh. presentation anyway. So. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, let's, let's make an appointment to talk next week. And uh, yeah. And yeah, anything that you want to show me beforehand or afterward, um, I'm happy to look at that. Anything else? Okay, um, so I want to know what all of you are thinking about in terms of Mrs. Dalloway. There are a couple of points that I want to make sure that I hit. Um, as we're just getting into this, because we're going to be spending three sessions on this anyway. So, um, uh, you know, there are certain things I want to make sure we cover. So I'm just going to put those kind of up on the board off the side here. Um, and, you know, maybe some of this will also kind of spark some stuff for you as well. So the major backgrounds that we want to try to hit are as follows. This is a novel published in 1925. So one thing that we need to recall is that World War I is still within recent memory, right? And in fact, the novel itself takes place slightly before 1925. So for the characters, World War I is an even more um, recent and present memory. I also want to talk a little bit about the social milieu that Virginia Woolf uh, hung out in, uh, the Bloomsbury Group. The Bloomsbury ideas and ethos, I think, have a big impact on <clears throat> what happens in this text. Um, we're going to talk about the way time works in the novel as well. And, you know, it might actually be a good idea to pull some of the Bergson stuff on Long and DeRay that we uh, used to discuss uh, Captain Mansfield out um, as we are looking over this. I think Walter Pater and his philosophy of experience is also a big influence on this. But it's probably less important that we talk about that than some of these other things. We might want to look at this in terms of developments in early 20th century feminism. And I think we can also gain some insight into what's going on here by looking at some of the things uh, that happen from a psychoanalytic perspective. So we're going to maybe apply some Freudian theory directly to um, what's going on in the novel. Not because um, I think that Freud is particularly useful for actually understanding contemporary human psyches, but because Wolf was interested in Freud and was familiar with his theories and is kind of directly working with them um, in her fiction. Um, so that said, like, let's try to get your impressions of this before we continue with it. So what did you all think of this? How'd this go for you? 
It was a little confusing to me at first, like with okay. the whole like flashbacks and like the time. It was okay. I think I just had to like I was reading it, but I wasn't like reading it. If that makes sense, so I had to like start over. I was like, okay, yeah, we have to figure this out. And this is a novel that is going to do that to you a lot because there are frequent shifts in temporal and physical setting and in perspective as well, right? So particularly, um, you know, that scene near the beginning where, there, where everyone in the square is watching the airplane, right? And it keeps going, like kind of goes around in a circle from perspective to perspective to perspective to perspective, and there are all these characters we're never gonna see again. And we're getting their thoughts about this airplane. Right? Trying to trying to puzzle out what the skywriter is spelling. Right? It turns out to be an ad for toffee. So yeah, so we've got these shifts in perspective. And we'll often see, as the quiz question indicated, right, the same events or the same characters from a number of different viewpoints. So we get these shifts in perspective, we get these shifts in time and place as well, right? You know, like Clarissa, for example, will be doing something in her house that reminds her of her childhood at the family estate in Borton, right? And then we'll get, you know, she'll be transported back to Borton for several pages. And the same thing happens to Peter Walsh. Um, after his meeting with Clarissa, right? So yeah, we, we jump around a lot and it can be really hard to keep track of where we are and whose head we're in. A lot of what's, I think a lot of what's happening here is that we're being put in the position of those people looking up in the, looking up at the sky, trying to puzzle out what that skywriter is spelling. So other impressions you guys got, were there other particular difficulties you experienced with this? I was going to say the same exact thing as Sam. <laughs> I, I don't know, at the beginning I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, wait a second. Then I was like, oh, hang on. And I had to like go back and like, uh -huh. like, try to piece up the other two. Yeah, you do a lot of retracing your steps here, right? Yeah. But then again, like so do the characters, right? Because so much of this is taking place in memory. And so much of this is about reassessing their memories. Right, and I think that the, like, I don't know, I think the novel really, like, emphasizes about how memories can be, like, altered through time. Yeah. You know, like, you, whenever you try to remember something, like, things change and feelings change. I feel like whenever you, uh -huh. like, reminisce on something, it could be not so great at the time, but then like when you're reminiscing on it, you get a whole different like perspective on it. Yeah. So I think that the novel's saying a lot about that. And I think that like, like I think yeah, like kind of following along with where you're going there. Like how many how many of you are how many of you are familiar with the idea of main character syndrome? I feel like I'm supposed to remember what this is because okay. I know I've talked about it in other class, <laughs> but it it is not there right now. Okay, so main character syndrome is kind of the notion that your life is like a story or like a movie, and that you're at the center of the action, and that you're kind of the central piece in everything that's happening, right? And I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that sounded at all like Dorian Gray. Okay, except Dorian Gray is kind of at the center of everything. Yeah, he's yeah. 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 That he was. He believed yeah. that that book uh -huh. was his life. Yeah. But I think, yeah, like, like a lot of, um, like, like what's happening, particularly to a character like Peter Walsh, right, um, is, um, you know, he's remembering events that don't revolve around him, right, as revolving around him and about his pain specifically, right, about his. Um, his rejection. So yeah, so we so we've got that going on. Um, did you also notice a lot of bells ringing as you're reading this? We get a lot of sounds of church bells ringing. 
Uh, let's go to the first one. Now, the, the, the first example is Big Ben. If you look on page four. Okay, and somebody can start, uh, start reading uh, from uh, the beginning of the last paragraph here for, for, for having lived in Westminster how many years now? For having lived in Westminster for how many years now? Over 20. One feels even in the midst of the traffic or walking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush or solemnity. An indescribable pause, a suspense that might be her heart affected by said influenza. Before Big Ben strikes, there out it blooms. Boom. First a warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. The circles is all in the air. So okay, we can, we can stop there, okay? So, what do you all know about these locations that are described? What do you all know about Westminster or about Big Ben? What's in Westminster? I'm assuming Westminster Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Westminster Abbey is there. <laughs> The, what, it, what's special or important about Westminster Abbey? Uh, it's where all the royals get buried. Yeah, it's where all of the like important political and cultural figures get buried there. Right? So there, are, you know, like for example, in Poets' Corner is where all of their monuments to all the famous poets, right? Um, yeah, famous, uh, you know, monarchs are buried there. Um, political figures are buried there, right? Um, prime ministers and so on and so forth. They also get married there. They also get married there and coronation takes place there, right? Okay, so what is this already telling us about the Westminster neighborhood and its role in British life? It is very affluent. Very affluent, yes. Very pro-royal. <laughs> very pro-royal, right, yeah. And it's kind of the center of political power. Isn't that where, like, the, they're, like, I was in Congress. Their Parliament is. Yes, that's the right. Yes, word. that that was exactly what that was actually what I was looking for. <laughs> I was trying to figure out yeah. what it was called. Like it's not Congress. Yes, the the Houses of Parliament are in Westminster. Is it attached to Big Ben? Yes. Okay. Big Ben is the giant clock that towers over the Houses of Parliament. So we have Big Ben as kind of like the official clock of the nation, right? That rings out the official time. And what do you notice about the sound? The way the sound is described here? You notice it will like stop your heart. Okay, yeah. And we're, it's hinted at throughout this that Clarissa, Clarissa has a weak heart, right? That she's been ill. It's not really specified what's wrong with her, but she's had an illness and her heart has been affected, right? What else do we notice about the sound specifically of Big Ben striking? It's warning and musical, and then it's described as lead in circles dissolving in the air. Yeah, lead in circles dissolved in the air. It's loud. Yeah. It's loud and, like, why leaden, do you think? Like the idea of lead in circles dissolving in the air. Because it's kind of like that. I'm trying to remember the scientific term that I was taught for this in band, okay. because my band director would be very disappointed in me for not remembering. But whenever uh -huh. you hear that very loud reverberating noise, you feel it in your chest. And it uh -huh. kind of hits you in the chest like a piece of metal or a piece of lead. Yeah. And it like sits there for a minute and it uh -huh. slowly fades out. Yeah, so what, like what quality of lead is being referenced there then? The hardness, the heaviness. Yeah, the hardness and the heaviness, right? So these circles of sound just weigh on everything, right? They weigh everything down. So there's this idea of time as a kind of weight, right? Particularly this official time, right? This official clock time. And if we think back to uh, our discussion of At the Bay and Henri Bergson, what, that, like, what kind of time would we associate this with? Like objective, measurable time. Yeah, this is what Bergson calls long, 
right? Oh. Just kind of like official time, you know, time that you're you know you're always checking your watch and making sure that you're here when you're supposed to be, and you know, that this is the you know the how your boss calculates your salary and all that shit, right? But here you have this official chronological objective clock time just weighs on everybody, right? Now one thing that I do want to point out here is that there are actually two churches whose ringing bells are described in this part of the novel, right? So on page 48, we've got Big Ben again, right? Remember my party, remember my party, said Peter Walsh, and he stepped down the street, speaking to himself rhythmically in time with the flow of sound, the direct downright sound of Big Ben striking the half hour, the leaden circles dissolved in the air, right? So repetition of the sound of Big Ben from before. But then as he's walking, he hears another church bell as well, right? On page 49. Can I get somebody uh, to start reading from us at St. Margaret's? Us at St. Margaret's, like a hostess who comes into her drawing room on the very stroke of the hour and finds her guests there already. I am not late. No, it is precisely half past 11, she says. Yet though she is perfectly right, her voice, being the voice of the hostess, is reluctant to inflict its individuality. Some grief for the past holds it back, some concern for the present. It is half past eleven, she says, and the sound of St. Margaret's glides into the recesses of the heart and buries itself in ring after ring of sound, like something alive which wants to confide itself, to disperse itself, to be with a tremor of delight at rest, like Clarissa herself, thought Peter Walsh coming down the stairs on the stroke of the hour of white. Okay, we can stop here, right? So let's compare what's going on with St. Margaret's to what was going on with St. With, uh, Big Ben. What can we tell, for example, about the ring of St. Margaret's in relation to Big Ben? Are they ringing at the same time? Yeah, St. Margaret's is slightly behind Big Ben, right? So they are ringing at different times. Big Ben rings the half hour, and then about a minute later, as Peter Walsh is walking down the street, St. Margaret's rings the half hour, right? So it's not in sync with Big Ben. What else is, you know, potentially interesting here about the way St. Margaret's bells are described? They're turn soft. Okay, they're softer, yeah. They're more timid, they're more reluctant, but with a desire to be like the louder. Okay, the, 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 he, he mentions reluctance, right? Like, the, like that, you know, minute out of sync is like holding back, right? Even though it's you know probably just a mechanism in the cogs. What else is like what what kinds of things does he compare the bells of St. Margaret's to? Something alive. Okay, yeah, like a living thing, right? Not like these dull lead rings, right? Good. What else? Keep going. Yeah, and how is how are these bells like Clarissa? She's hiding, but she's also living. Uh huh. She's out and about in public and society. She likes walking in London. Mm -hmm. She likes to have these parties, but at the same time, she's hiding. 
Yeah, she also she you know she she lives up in a lonely little attic. She sleeps up in a lonely little attic room with you know what she describes as a narrow bed, right? And one thing that we hear her keep repeating, like a phrase that she keeps coming back to, are you know variations on right, right. That is all. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but I just want to stick with St. Margaret's for a minute. Like, what does Peter accuse Clarissa of being when he's angry with her? What does he call her that upsets her back in their memories? You might want to think about this also in terms of what Clarissa is waiting for. Right? What is she preparing for? Specifically. What does she need to order the flowers for, for example? What does she insist Peter remember? Oh, the party. Yeah, she's preparing for a party, right? She's having the doors taken off the hinges for the party. If you look on page 62, right, this is uh, Peter's memory of Richard Galloway's first appearance at Borden. The perfect hostess, he said to her, whereupon she winced all over, but he meant her to feel it. He would have done anything to hurt her after seeing her with Dalloway, so she left him. So the same word is used in um, describing St. Margaret's, right? This idea of like, it's the voice of the hostess, reluctant to inflict its individuality. Now, and I think this is where we can link the time discourse up with feminist discourse. So we all remember the whole new woman, angel of the house, angel in the house, fallen woman thing, right? So have you seen examples of this kind of working out in the novel so far, even in like these first 64 pages? Do we see, for example, um, like a character who seems to represent these new these new woman kind of attributes? I feel like Clarissa does, or she's she wants to, uh -huh. but she's stuck in the angel of the house role because that's who she married, basically. Uh huh. Yeah, she she married a Tory politician, right? And so her life has been conventionality. Whereas in her youth, she did have this friend with whom she dreamed unconventional dreams, right? You know, this friend who smoked cigars and who, you know, ran naked down the hallway and took, you know, pleasure in shocking people, right? There's this friend, Sally Seaton. who at least in youth had these new woman characteristics. Right? We don't know anything yet about what Sally is like now, but that's something to watch as we continue reading the novel, right? what has become of Sally Seaton. And in fact, one of Clarissa's treasured memories is sharing a little secret kiss with Sally, right? So, <clears throat> Wolf thought and wrote a lot about the angel in the house motif. And she considered that particular ideology, that particular um, symbol, the thing that most held middle class women back.
from self-expression. So I'm going to read you a little bit from an essay that she wrote in 1940 called Professions for Women. In which she attempts to define the angel in the house and explain what must be done with her. Articles have to be about something. Mine, I seem to remember, was about a novel by a famous man. And while I was writing this review, I discovered that if I were going to review books, I should need to do battle with a certain phantom. And the phantom was a woman. And when I came to know her better, I called her after the heroine of a famous poem, The Angel in the House. It was she who used to come between me and my paper when I was writing reviews. It was she who bothered and wasted my time and so tormented me that at last I killed her. You who come of a younger and happier generation may not have heard of her. You may not know what I mean by The Angel in the House. I will describe her as shortly as I can. She was intensely sympathetic. She was immensely charming. She was utterly unselfish. She excelled in the difficult arts of family life. She sacrificed herself daily. If there was chicken, she took the leg. If there was a draft, she sat in it. In short, she was so constituted that she never had a mind or a wish of her own, but preferred to sympathize always with the minds and wishes of others. Above all, I need not say it, she was pure. Her purity was supposed to be her chief beauty, her blushes, her great grace. In those days, the last of Queen Victoria, every house had its angel. So, so far at least, like, who does this sound like? If we're applying this to this novel. Clarissa. Yeah, Clarissa seems to have a lot of these characteristics, right? Um, she cares a great deal about what others think of her. Um, you know, she is willing to sacrifice her own comforts for the sake of Richard or for Elizabeth or even for Peter, right? Um, and she is always trying to, like, put herself in other people's positions, right? You know, she, she does seem to have a, a, a kind of talent for empathy, right? And when I came to write, I encountered her with the very first words. The shadow of her wings fell on my page. I heard the rustling of her skirts in the room. Directly, that is to say, I took my pen in my hand to review that novel by a famous man. She slipped behind me and whispered, My dear, you are a young woman. You are writing about a book that has been written by a man. Be sympathetic, be tender, flatter, deceive. Use all the arts and wiles of our sex. Never let anybody guess that you have a mind of your own. Above all, be pure. And she made as if to guide my pen. I now record the one act for which I take some credit to myself, though the credit rightly belongs to some excellent ancestors of mine who left me a certain sum of money, shall we say 500 pounds a year, so that it was not necessary for me to depend solely on charm for my living. I turned upon her and caught her by the throat. I did my best to kill her. My excuse, if I were to be had up in a court of law, would be that I acted in self-defense. Had I not killed her, she would have killed me. So let's just kind of think about this episode of killing the angel in the house, right? Why does Wolf feel she needs to kill the angel? She yeah, the angel is what's stopping her from writing honestly, right? Every time she makes to put her opinion down on the page, the angel, right, this ideology that she's grown up with, keeps getting in the way and stopping her from saying what she really thinks. So, yeah, exactly. She's, she's arguing that the angel is a kind of oppressive ideology that prevents women from genuinely expressing themselves. And, you know, she's free from financial necessity, so she doesn't have to worry about finding a husband and being charming just to survive, which she says allows her a certain kind of freedom in dealing with the angel, right? 
Like, I don't have to put up with this shit. I'm just going to, I'm going to strangle it. So, has Clarissa Dalloway managed to strangle her idea of the angel? So, you, you would say no, Sam. Why not? Why do you think she hasn't? I mean, she's still living this, like, I'm trying to remember what the right word is. This uh -huh. closed in life that I mean, people in the house would have, like, she's throwing parties, she's caring for the house. Uh -huh. like, yeah, there's some bits and pieces where she's, like, a little more open, but she's still doing what every wife did at the IT tips. Oh, but yeah, but, she's still, yeah, she's playing the role of good wife of Tory politician, right? Even though, like, what are, we, what, are, what are we already able to tell about their marriage by this point? It's not there. Okay. There's a lot of secrecy in it, I feel like. Okay. Why would you, why, what, 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 what suggests secrecy to you, Bree? Well, we don't really see him a lot. We haven't seen him yet, right? And we also don't see her. We see Clarissa speaking with a lot of other characters. She's off on uh -huh. her own. She goes for walks on her own. She mm -hmm. does all these things. And uh -huh. if you're supposed to be, you know, the angel in the house, the good wife, mm -hmm. I don't feel like you're supposed to go walking on your own. Well, um, men. the the fact that you were the angel in the house didn't necessarily meant you were confined yeah. to the house. <laughs> Generally speaking, you could leave for but legitimate. But she's also still talking to the guy who proposed to her. Uh huh. And he's still like coming to see her. Ah, but did she invite him to come see no. her? No. But did she tell him to go away? <laughs> but that's being the angel house, welcoming him into her house. Right. I mean, she. But would her husband want him there? She's supposed to do what her husband wants. Does her husband know that? That's the female. Other I, I, I imagine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I mean, they, they all knew each other when they, they were young, right? Other, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, I, I think that yeah, there is a point that yeah, Peter forces his way into the house, yeah. right? He talks his way past the maze. That oh, of course you'll see me, right? And this is actually I think where things get Freudian, right? If we want to talk, if we want to look at this from a psychoanalytic perspective, right? What do we notice? What is Peter always doing? What's he always fiddling with? Yeah, he's got this pocket knife that he's always opening and closing, right? And running his finger along. I feel like he's got some issues. Okay. Yeah, I so thought, you. I thought that was strange when I read that too. Yeah. I'm not with you. And at the same time that he is fiddling with the pocket knife, right? She keeps opening and closing a pair of scissors. Association with pocket knives is someone has them on Christmas and you like pass around like opening the boxes. Okay. And you do the same thing with scissors. Sure. But I feel like in this moment in time, the pocket knife is more like of a masculine thing, and then the scissors are the more feminine thing. So I felt I felt like it was yeah. played at all the same level. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. They're both doing the same thing. They're both got these two kind of sexual symbols that are both cutting objects, right? But yeah, the, the scissors open and close, and the knife is just a long, sharp thing, right? What are those words? Phallic and yonic, right? So uh, phallic symbol is, in Freudian terminology, a symbol of male sexuality, right? Where it, so basically, um, anything long and straight. Whereas a yonic symbol, um, is a symbol of female sexuality, usually something concave or something that opens and closes. Like in this case, the, the scissors are actually unusual in being a cutting object, but like things like a cup or a lake or you know a cauldron, things like that. 
And yeah, so they're both fiddling with the, so that they, there's ev it's kind of evidence of kind of sexual tension, right? Which I'm sure there would be with like, your ex-lovers. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they have a, a long history. And, you know, they're all you know, kind of like blushes and they're still nervous around each other, right? But I think I want to point also to the way um, <clears throat> Clarissa watches Peter fiddling with the knife as well, right? If you look on page 44. Um, can I get somebody to start reading from what an extraordinary habit that was? What an extraordinary habit that was, Clarissa thought, always playing with a knife, always making one feel too frivolous and divided, a mere silly chatterbox as he used. But I too, she thought, am taking up her needle, summoned like a queen whose guards have fallen asleep and left her unprotected. She had been quite taken aback by this visit. It had, it had upset her. So that anyone can stroll in and have a look at her where she lies with the brambles curving over her, summoned to her help the thing she did, the thing she liked, her husband, Elizabeth, herself, in short, which Peter hardly knew now, all to come about her and beat off the enemy. So if we look at the way she describes Peter's knife, well, for, for one thing, how long has he had the knife? Very long, apparently always. Yeah, he, she says he's had it for at least 30 years, right? So the knife then is a relic of, Pe of a relic of what? Peter's past. Yeah, Peter's past, like, kind of like his boyhood, right? So this is almost like a childish kind of habit that he has retained into adulthood. So there's something in, like, Clarissa's perception of Peter's playing with the knife as a, like it's almost something like masturbatory or like like a sign of like arrested sexual development, right? And indeed, what can we tell from later on about Peter's kind of general taste in women? Is Peter typically attracted to women his own age? Yeah, he likes the younger ones. Yeah, in fact, he goes so far as to stalk a young woman he sees in the park, right? All the while, again, fiddling with the knife. Until she runs back into her apartment. And we see the whole thing from his perspective, not hers, right? So, um... Let's just take a quick look at that. Can I get somebody to start reading uh, from the bottom of page 52? Straightening himself and stealthily fingering his pocket knife. Straightening himself and stealthily fingering his pocket knife, he started after her to follow this woman. This excitement, which seemed even with its back turned, to shed on him the light which connected them singled him out as if the random upward traffic had whispered through hollow hands his name, not Peter, but his private name which he called himself in his own thoughts. You, she said, only you, saying it with her white gloves and her shoulders. Then the thin long cloak which the wind stirred as she walked past Dent's shop in Cockford Street blew out with an enveloping kindness and a mournful tenderness as of arms that would open and take the tire. Okay, and then um, skip ahead a little bit to, but other people got between them in the street. But other people got between them in the street, obstructing him, blotting her up. He burst. She changed. There was a color in her cheeks, mockery in her eyes. He was an adventurer, reckless, he thought, swift, daring, indeed, landed as he was last night from India, a romantic buccaneer, careless of all these damn proprieties, yellow dressing gowns, pipes, fishing rods, and the shop windows, and respectability in evening parties, and Bruce Oldman wearing white slits beneath their waistcoats. He was a buccaneer. Okay, so let's like pause for a minute and like think about how Peter perceives all this playing out. Like, what does he see when he sees like the color in her cheeks as she's walking away from him? I think he sees this as like a game and like she likes him back and she's just like toying with him. Yeah. But uh, anybody who's following me with like the pocket knife? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, yeah there's one yeah. of these guys, so like, now they seem would not know if I take no for an answer. And he'd be uh -huh. like, well, I bought you a drink, and he'd be like, thank you, but that uh -huh. just, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, he, go ahead. He's got some lingering issues mm -hmm. from, I think, past events, and I don't think he's aware of how it's affecting him. Yeah, he certainly doesn't seem to be aware of how this might be perceived by the young woman in yeah. question here, right? You know, you know, why does she have color in her cheeks? Probably because she's huffing and puffing trying to get away from it, right? You know, especially given the speed with which she opens up her apartment door and, um, you know, makes her way inside, right? Um, if we look at, you know, page 54, right? Laughing and delightful, she had crossed Oxford, Oxford Street and Great Portland Street and turned down one of the little streets, and now, and now, the great moment was approaching, for now she slackened, opened her bag, and with one look in his direction, but not at him, one look that bade farewell, summed up the whole situation and dismissed it triumphantly, forever, had fitted her key, opened the door, and gone. So, in Peter's eyes, this is all game of seduction, right? In this woman's eyes, this is probably getting the hell away from a stalker. Right? This creep started following me in the park, and it was all I could do to get home with all speed. So, in Freudian terms, right? And let me explain why Freud is particularly relevant to Wolf here first, right? So, Wolf and her husband actually ran a small independent press. It was called the Hogarth Press. And they ran it from 1917 to 1946, when it was bought out by one of the big British publishing houses. But in addition to publishing um, works by some of their good friends, um, other Bloomsbury intellectuals. They also published a lot of translations of psychoanalytic texts that were coming out of Central Europe at the time. So, you know, the work of people like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and you know, some of their acolytes, right? So Wolf was familiar with and interested in these psychoanalytic concepts. So it actually makes sense to read her work in these terms, right? especially as like she and her husband are instrumental in introducing several of these ideas to an English readership. And those of you who've done the theory class, have you all done psychoanalytic theory? Yes, okay. I think. Okay, so what, what, what do you remember about it, Anna? Like, what do you recall about it? Uh, I have my <laughs> I notes. Have your notes. <laughs> <laughs> I have my notes. <laughs> do I remember anything? You can't blame me for what I don't remember for theory. That was the <laughs> semester uh, halfway through, we went online and everything went yeah. down. I yeah. haven't taken so it yet. So I can't be blamed. Uh -huh. I don't even know if we did it yet, actually. Because it was like closer in the book, but I think we skipped over it. I think we're coming back to it. I think. Okay, okay. We might have done it, I just yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I could remember from that class is cultural studies. All right. No, no, we didn't. We didn't do it. I don't remember it now. Okay. So the central element of Freud's theory is about right desire. And by desire, like this is often read as kind of simply sexual desire, but essentially like it means like desire just means like you know something that you want intensely, right? And what we tend to do in dreams and in narratives is uh, kind of encode what our desires are into um, these kind of more standard literal narratives, right? So from a Freudian perspective, all text is essentially allegorical, right? It works on two levels. The first 
is the manifest content. And the manifest content is what literally happens in your um, um, in your dream or in the narrative, right? So the manifest content here would be Peter playing with his pocket knife and Clarissa opening and closing the scissors, right? The latent content is the sublimated desire that is expressed in the manifest content, right? So because we know that like these desires are often things that, you know, maybe we're not supposed to have, right? Or that, you know, would reflect badly on us if we openly expressed that we wanted them. We, do, we, through a process called sublimation, we turn them into symbols. So the knife and the scissors become these symbols of Peter and Clarissa's um, simultaneous desire and repulsion, right? Because, you know, they are, on the one hand, you know, they're both shaped in, uh, you know, the conventional sexual manner, right? But they're also both cutting instruments. So they're instruments of separation as well. Right. So, how are we doing so far? We're here. All right. We're on board the boat. All right, has this gotten too weird for you yet? <laughs> no, surprisingly not. All right. The Titanic is still, let's see, still <laughs> Oh, good. All right, yeah, Hannah. I have noticed something here. I don't know if I'm just reaching or if it's actually relevant. Reach away. Um, but, okay, so in the garden party, uh -huh. Laura's wearing the hat. Yes. And it is like a symbolism of like, you know, like, upper class and stuff, and uh -huh. I can't remember where it was, but I thought that a hat was mentioned in here, and it made me think of the garden party uh -huh. and how this hat is like symbolizing. Yeah, you're, there, there's a point where uh, Clarissa takes off and puts away a hat or something, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's literally just a hat, but it, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, right? But Yeah, um, yeah no, um, I, I think you're probably right to think about this as being similar to the garden party. Uh, Wolf and Mansfield did know each other. Um, I wouldn't say they were exactly friends, but they traveled in similar circles, they knew a lot of the same people, and they did um, social. Wolf kind of looked down on Mansfield a little bit as someone a little bit common. Um, you know, like Mansfield was a, you know, was a Kiwi trying to make it London. So there's that kind of aspect of the colonial trying to integrate herself into London society, not entirely successfully. Um, but yeah, I think that the whole idea of the party here, right, and then, you know, Elizabeth, the daughter, being 18 years old and on kind of like the verge of adulthood, right, um, and some of the condescending thoughts about working people, yeah, I think there's a lot here that is really similar to what's going on in Mansfield. I think the, the primary difference here being that the central consciousness in the story um, is a middle-aged woman rather than a young girl. So we're looking at you know, like very different stages of life. Yeah, even like, you know, Clarissa's gonna throw a party, right? This is all preparation for a party. And even kind of like some of the stuff about death that suffuses the garden party, I think, is present here as well. Um, let's point for a second to page 31. I think I kind of mentioned this 
before. And I think that this is um, maybe also where she's taken off the taking off the hat. Um, can I get somebody to start reading from like a nun withdrawing? Like a nun withdrawing, or a child exploring a tower, she went upstairs, paused at the window, came to the bathroom. There was the green linoleum and mm -hmm. a tap dripping. There was an emptiness about the heart of life, an attic room. Women must put off their rich apparel. At midday, they must disrobe. She pierced the pincushion and laid her feathered yellow hat on the bed. The sheets were clean, tight stretched in a broad white band from side to side. Narrower and narrower would her bed be. The candle was half burnt down, and she had read deep in Baron Marbot's memoirs. She had read late at night of the retreat from Moscow, for the house sat so long that Richard insisted, after her illness, that she must sleep undisturbed. And really, she preferred to read of the retreat from Moscow. He knew it. So the room was an attic, uh, the bed narrow, and lying there reading, for she slept badly. She could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth, which clung to her like a sheet. Lovely in girlhood, suddenly there came a moment. For example, on the river beneath the woods at Leviden, mm -hmm. when through some contraction of this cold spirit, she had failed him. Okay, thanks. I think we can pause here, right? So I think there are two important ideas intersecting. Um, in this paragraph here. One of them um, kind of like hinted at directly through the language of the paragraph and the other more kind of symbolic. So what information are we getting here about Clarissa's relationship with Richard? They're not rolling in the bushes. They are not and have not been for some time, right? They no longer sleep in the same bed. Um, it appears that like they've never, like apparently she has never particularly enjoyed having sex with Richard, right? And she re regards this as a way in which she has failed him, right? A coldness of spirit on her part. So this is kind of very angel in the house -y, right? Is, you know, like I could not give him what he wanted, right? Thinking of it as a a way in which she failed him, rather than thinking about ways in which he might have failed her, right? But there's another th thread that's kind of coming through all of this, right? If we look, for example, at the narrower and narrower would her bed be, the candle half burnt down, the virginity which clings to her like a sheet, What else does this maybe look like? What else is she thinking about or contemplating? Her own purity. What's that? Her own purity. Not purity. Sexuality. Not sexuality either. Think, think about a narrow bed in which someone is laid in a sh laid wrapped oh, in a sheet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah exactly. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, because like she's 50, so she's like halfway through her life. Yeah, the candle half burned down, right? Yeah. Halfway through your life because you should be so lucky, right? I see. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, she's thinking about her death here. This is also she she keeps quoting this line, fear no more, as well. I'm guessing that because it's from a, fair, a, a Shakespeare play that is fairly obscure now, you probably don't know this reference, but it's the funeral song from one of Shakespeare's late romances, Cymbeline. And the gist of it is to kind of like welcome death as a friend and as a release from pain. I feel like we went over Emily in my Okay, so do, do you remember the uh, the fear no more, the heat of the sun? I think so. Okay. I went 
It was Dr. Russell's class, so I feel like. <laughs> Yeah, R Russell's a weird guy, so I imagine it was probably a weird selection of plays. I, I clearly remember the title. <laughs> I can't tell you if it was so fast. But I think we, we can also, we can link all of this up with the general attitude towards time here, right? And the constant ringing of Big Ben and those leaden circles spreading out over central London, right? You know, this idea of your kind of time weighing them down, weighing Clarissa down, and this awareness that the time allotted to her is growing shorter, right? So overall, like, just pay a lot of attention to references to clocks, um, references to things that look like graves. Um, there's something that I, that something else I wanted to quickly point out, like oh, when Peter's uh, smoking his cigar, as he's thinking uh, naughty thoughts about Clarissa's daughter Elizabeth, right? His cigar smoke on page 56 begins to wobble into hourglass shapes and then taper away, like almost kind of like reminding him that he's too old to be thinking about an 18 year old girl in this way. I, okay, so this is like, do I get covered? Uh -huh. But I like rolling in the historical fashion. Okay. And so I, this is, I thought it was really cool how they like, well one, the pierce the pin cushion, she's literally taking out her like, her uh -huh. hat pin, her hat pin. Yeah. Which is just, I love that. But also, in this day and age, girls wouldn't wear hats to parties, they would wear like bows. And so that's okay. why the hat in the garden party is, I feel like, I feel like it was really symbolic because it's kind of, it was Laura's coming out, so she's right, wearing a hat. Right, right. Okay, yeah. She's you, in yeah. society. And you, don't, then, you don't wear a bow anymore. You're an adult now. You're a woman, not a yeah. girl, so you wear a hat. Okay. And girls would wear hats like outside, like on waltz. But yeah. And then I thought it was cool because she takes off the hat, and then she goes back into her like childhood like memories. Yeah. So she's like taking the hat off of adulthood and going back into her memories as like a child. No, I, 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 think, I, think, that, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think that that's, that's a good solid reading of this. I just really like fashion, so it's just, it's, it's in here. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, good, it's good that you do, because otherwise, like, I honestly had no idea about that, about yeah. the bows and the hats. Like, you know, historical women's fashion is not something I am particularly up on. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, like, do you do, like, 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 cosplay kind of stuff, or is it, like, period cosplay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, I mostly, like, from, like, Antebellum until about the 1920s. That's where most of my knowledge is. Okay. So, so this this is this is right at the end yeah. of your wheelhouse thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. And yeah, I mean, like honestly, like when when y'all know about you know, I was about to say weird shit like this. I know it's not weird. It's, it's, it's not weird to have an interest. It's not weird to have an interest. Uncommon knowledge. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When, when you have <laughs> uncommon knowledge, yeah, feel, feel free to share it. Yeah. Um, all right. So. We're about out of time. I'm going to give you the guide questions for next time. Bree is going to take us through um, the Septimus Smith stuff. And y'all have yourselves a good weekend. Yeah, I was sitting over here like when we were reading the garden party, you know, talking about like Laura's white dress. Uh huh. And those are called lingerie dresses. Okay. They're like, they're very much like just one or two layers of like white cotton and uh -huh. they were like very detailed with lace. And I was just like, it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly didn't I didn't know there was any such thing. It's yeah. Yeah, it's not